Welcome to the 100th episode of the Indie Film Hustle podcast. May I bring my main man, Will Smith, in to start off this show. The guy who is willing to hustle the most is going to be the guy that just gets that loose ball. You know, he, uh, he got the O, oh, he got the O, oh, okay, he got two. He got, ooh, God, he hustled, he grabbed out when that was going to be out of bounds, but he saved it yeah. uh, back in. It's like the commodity that I see the majority of people who aren't getting the places they want or aren't achieving the things that, that they want in this business is strictly based on hustle. It's strictly based on being outworked. It's strictly based on missing crucial opportunities. I say all the time, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm, every day I'm, every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm, every day I'm, every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm hustling. Hustling, 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 hustling. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to the 100th episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I cannot believe we have made it this far, but as always, I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. And before we uh, we get into the show, guys, I, I, I just am... Blown away that I've been able to keep this up for 100 episodes. It's actually quite, uh, I'm impressed with myself. (laughs) And I want to thank you guys all for all the support and everything you guys have done for the show, for the website, and getting the word out on what we're trying to do at Indie Film Hustle, man. So thank you so much. I found this quote and I felt that it was a perfect perfect example of what this podcast and what I have been preaching about for so long encompasses all of that. The most difficult thing in the world is to reveal yourself, to express what you have to. As an artist, I feel that we must try many things, but above all, we must dare to fail. You must be willing to risk everything to really express it all. John Cassavetes. Now, today's show is sponsored by Videoblocks. Now, Videoblocks is a subscription-based stock media company that gives you unlimited access to premium stock footage everyone could afford. If you're looking for like extra exterior shots or things that you might want to incorporate into any of your projects, whether it be a narrative, documentary, music videos, commercials, these guys got you covered. They've got unlimited daily downloads from a library of over 115,000 HD video clips, as well as a huge selection of After Effects templates for like opening credits, uh, motion graphics titles, company logos, as well as motion backgrounds as well. It's pretty amazing. And at, on average, uh, subscribers pay less than a dollar per download in a course of a year. And the content does not get stale. They're constantly adding new content to the library every month. So it keeps it keeps it very, very fresh and you always have something new to look forward to. And everything you download is 100% royalty free. Even if your subscription is canceled, you have unrestricted usage rights for anything you want to do, including personal projects and commercial projects. And you keep whatever you download and maintain the usage rights forever. Now, Video Blocks is offering The Tribe a yearly subscription for 99 bucks. That's 50 bucks off the usual price tag just for you guys, just for The Tribe. That's less than 10 bucks a month. So to get this deal, just head over to videoblocks.com slash hustle. That's videoblocks, V-I-D-E-O blocks.com forward slash hustle for this exclusive offer. And don't forget to go to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to download your free filmmaking audiobooks from Audible. Now that we got that out of the way... We can get to the celebration that is the 100th episode of the Indie Film Hustle podcast. Guys, man, again, thank you so much. I'm so excited uh, that we've gotten this far. When I started this little podcast less than a year ago, because I'm crazy, uh, (laughs) I had no idea uh, that I would get to 100 episodes, let alone as fast as I did, and let alone as the shows become so popular, 
I can't even believe that it's become as popular as it has. And the show has, um, based on all the emails and messages that I get from you guys, the tribe, uh, it's really helping a lot of people out there. And that's my goal with this podcast uh, and with Indie Film Hustle. I want to help as many filmmakers as I can to survive and thrive in this business and make a living, as I did in episode 88, uh, make a make a livable wage doing your art. And that's what I'm here to do, guys. And, and I'm hoping that I can take you guys on my journey that I'm going to be going on with This Is Meg uh, and all the next movies that I'm going to be making and all the other stuff I'm going to be doing in the coming years. So I really am so grateful and so humbled by by this achievement that we've been able to get to 100 episodes. And we got some surprises for you today. I uh, got some I have a really really amazing guest and I'm going to it's going to be a it's a it's a mystery guest. Actually mystery guests. Uh I have a second guest that comes in at the end of the show. Uh really cool stuff, really good information, but I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. But first and foremost, uh I've got a couple of surprises for you and this is a show going to be full of surprises. And for those who wait till the very end, there might be even another surprise for you. But uh, I wanted to let you guys know that I have jumped into the Amazon Video Direct pool and wanted to see what was going on with that. I remember I, you guys, uh, a while ago, I did a podcast about uh, how you could start making money today uh, putting your movies up on Amazon Video Direct as a self-distribution way of doing things. So I've now, like myself, I've become the guinea pig or, um, as Pat Flynn says, the crash test dummy of... Um, of the film industry for me. And I, I wanted to see what happens and test it out first before um, before I come back and report. Well, I have put up my short films. Uh, I put up uh, Broken, the original Broken, Red Princess Blues, Red Princess Blues, uh, Red Princess Blues Genesis, the anime, and also my uh, another little short film I did called Sin, A Twisted Tale. And I put them all up on Amazon Video Direct and I started making money. It's amazing, and I haven't promoted it at all. This is the first time I've talked about it on the show, and I, I really wanted to put a test to see what happens. So um, I started making a little bit of money with it. You know, it's not a, a huge amount of money, but, you know, for a few days, you know, I got, got another, like, 15 or 20 bucks. You know, that's not bad, you know, for short films, and that I could see the potential of where it could go because of uh, if I start promoting it, and you guys know I I, uh, I tend to promote it occasionally, uh, my stuff. Uh, if I start promoting it, uh, it could turn into a nice little revenue stream, additional revenue stream um, for for me. So I will continue to give you updates on how that's going. I plan to do a video uh, in the future. Uh, don't hold me to it, but sometime in the future, I plan to do a video that will uh, let me let me show you guys how I actually uploaded everything, physically go through it, and I'll show you what uh, the movies are making and all that kind of stuff. So I want to kind of open that door for you. But it's a really big deal, guys. You really should go into Amazon Video Direct and uh, and upload. If you have an old short film, um, I'll show you, I'll tell you little secrets on how to get it closed captioned. Uh, you can go to a website called Fiverr.com. And Fiverr.com, and I'll put a link in the description, uh, Fiverr.com will allow you to get this thing closed captioned uh, very inexpensively, especially if it's you know if it's under twenty minutes, if it's short, but even for features, you can get it done well and inexpensively. There, I'm talking like maybe you know for a feature, you're talking to maybe I don't know maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty bucks when it normally would cost you probably like five or six hundred. Um, but uh, but for shorts, five, ten bucks, twenty bucks, so it's worth it. And the thing is, this guys that you are at the beginning stages. So imagine. Amazon Video Direct as YouTube was in 2005. It's a very new platform. It's brand new. But the big thing that Amazon has that uh, that YouTube didn't back then is they, they are the largest marketplace in the world. And they have a huge fan base, a huge uh, customer base that, that, that can go through. But I'm not going to keep going on and on about Amazon Video Direct. If you guys want to watch my short films, uh, Broken, Red Princess, Red Princess Genesis, and uh, Sin... A Twisted Tale, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Amazon. And that will take you directly to Amazon where all four movies would be there. I would greatly appreciate you guys leaving me a good review on all of them. So the more reviews I get, 
the better uh, rankings we get. So again, this is a test. I'm using my movies and myself as a guinea pig. So let's see how many reviews we can put up on on the website. If you guys on on the on Amazon, if you guys really mean, if you guys want to help support me, this is a really great easy way to do it. So head over and give me a, a good review. Hopefully, if you like them. Um, if you don't, please don't leave a review. <laughs> but uh, but that would help. And let's see what happens because. I can report back to you guys and go, look, you know, I got 30 reviews and all of a sudden the revenue just jumped. So I I want to kind of test this out, guys, because we're at the very early stages and I want to help you guys uh, as well as help myself and see what we can do with this, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, check, it, check it out, IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Amazon. And we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Because this is the 100th episode, I am giving away, believe it or not, a free month membership to the Indie Film Syndicate. That's right. I'm going to give you a one-month membership for free so you guys can go in, check things out, see what's going on. And I'm going to be changing a bunch of stuff up in the, in the syndicate. I'm going to be adding new stuff. As soon as This Is Meg is completely finished in post, which will be done in about two weeks, uh, I will be able to start focusing my energies back onto Syndicate as far as putting more of uh, or more of my original content up, more of my uh, uh, tutorials and things like that of the stuff that when I went through through Meg. And I really want to make the Syndicate a place where I can go and just deposit all the information that I learn along the way um, and sh- share exclusive stuff with you guys on my journey with Meg, you know, I'm going to share all the way how I made it. And then I'm going to share all the way how I'm getting it distributed, going to festivals, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to share it with you guys at the syndicate. Uh, and as well, you'll get access to the, um, the Facebook group where you can talk to us directly uh, and, you know, interact with the community. Each, you know, the community members help each other out. It's a really wonderful place and, and we're building it up. But I want to give the tribe uh, a taste so uh, it'll be a free month. So all you got to do is go to the show notes of the show, which are at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 100. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 100. And I'll have a link there for you for a, uh, a free month. And it's going to be limited time, guys. Uh, it's not going to last forever. It's going to give you a week. So it's only going to be available till next Thursday. That's it. After that, the, the open window is gone. So I want you guys to get in there, check things out, as uh, and, and, and really have some fun. It's a lot of stuff, and I've added a lot of stuff since we opened it as well. So that's another little gift I'm giving you guys. I really want to give you uh, a, a little sneak peek of the syndicate. Now, I have a lot of exciting things coming up for Indie Film Hustle and uh, and the podcast coming up in the next, probably by the end of the year, for the next three months or so, three to four months. Uh, I'm planning on putting a lot of energy back into Indie Film Hustle. I mean, I've been away a little bit because I was shooting a feature film. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to be putting a lot of energy in, so please definitely check back uh, to the to the website. And I'm going to be doing some changes, adding some new stuff. Um, just going to be doing a whole lot of stuff. We've got uh, courses. I've got three courses lined up. They're literally in my hard drive, already shot. I just have to edit them and put them together. I have an amazing course, which I hope to release next month, uh, and a sneak peek will be in the syndicate on uh, a how to shoot super 16 millimeter film masterclass. And this is the first time I've talked about this because I went down uh, to Miami where I met with uh, a legend in the film industry down there, and uh, we sat down and did this insane course on everything you ever needed to know about shooting a super 16 millimeter film. And you ask me, Alex, why the heck are you going to want to shoot super 16? You just shot your movie on a black, uh, black magic or DSLR or whatever you want to do it. And why would you shoot super 16? Well, believe it or not, guys, there's still a lot of people and it's actually re- coming back. Uh, super 16 uh, film is a very affordable way to get a specific look. Uh, Walking Dead is shot on super 16. Believe it or not, that one of the number one shows on television, shot on Super 16. It's a lot of shows. We're going to get really deep into uh, a lot of the, the shows that are being shot with, a lot of the technical stuff. So if you want, you're a filmmaker and want to shoot film, I'm going to give you an entire master class on how to shoot film from what film is, how to choose your right film, 
to how to load the cameras, what kind of cameras there are, the histories of the cameras, how they work, the whole ball of wax. And then I have another course, which is, and I can't even explain to you how insane this course is. It is a Cinema Lens Master Class. And when I say master class, I mean literally we went to a rental house who's been around for 65 years and opened up every lens, showed it to you, explained it to you, showed you what it looked like on screen. And really it gave you all the details about everything about how lenses work. It was I learned so much I can't even explain to you. It is such a cool cool um, course and I'm going to be releasing that as well and then our third course is and it's a little bit more specialized but really a lot of fun filters an entire master class on every kind of filter in the history of man I mean seriously there's so many different filters uh, and there's such cool stuff that you can do with filters so that's another course we're going to put together and I'm going to create a monster massive course that will have all three of these courses all in one. So if you are going to go shoot film, you are going to know everything about everything about everything that you need to do uh, to shoot Super 16. So there's going to be a bunch of cool stuff coming up, uh, and that's going to come out in the next few months. Hopefully, uh, the Super 16 uh, course will come out. The first the first stage will come out uh, next month, if not shortly thereafter. So keep an eye on that, and I will talk about that, give you guys special deals, special access, of course, because you guys are loyal Indie Film Hustle tribe members. Uh, And uh, and there's just a ton of other stuff that I'm going to be doing uh, in the coming next three months and then after the new year. Uh, So definitely keep an eye out, guys. It's going to be a really exciting time for Indie Film Hustle. Uh, And, and, you know, I I want to, again, once again, thank you, because honestly, I don't think I would have been able to make This Is Meg without you guys. Uh, not only the the people who are the tribe members who actually helped me financially uh, and actually donated, that was huge, and I can't express my thanks enough, but um, for just the community and the well wishes and the support, you know, you guys gave me the courage to go out and make a movie because I'm, I'm basically your soldier. I'm going out there and uh, going into the trenches, and I'm coming back with news of what I saw. And that's what I'm I'm hoping to do that for many, many years to come to continue to report back and give you guys that information that uh, is not readily available. So thank you again, because without you guys, I wouldn't have been able to make This Is Meg. And I can't wait for you guys to see the movie and for the world to see the movie. And uh, I'm just really, really excited. Now, today's guest, the surprise mystery guest, his name is Aaron Kaufman. Now, for those who don't know who Aaron Kaufman is, Aaron Kaufman was the producer for Robert Rodriguez for over seven years. And he uh, produced uh, the sequel to Sin City, both Machetes, uh, worked on Spy Kids, and worked very closely with Robert for the cor- over the course of seven years. And I uh, grilled him about uh, the process that Robert works on, how he got into the business, uh, as well as he's an accomplished director himself, which he directed a movie called Urge, uh, starring James Bond, Pierce Brosnan, uh, which is a really cool flick as well. Uh, and then we later in the ep- in the interview, uh, we bring in Brian Levine, uh, who is a producer on the new film Flock of Dudes, which also Aaron produced. Very cool indie movie done on a very low budget and also kind of done on a run and gun style that um, that we did on This Is Meg, probably at a little bit higher budget range than we worked with. But it was a really educational process. Uh, they explained their entire process and how they did it, how they got the movie made, with the, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, if you guys are fans of Robert Rodriguez, you guys are going to love this episode. And I grilled Aaron, poor Aaron, I grilled him pretty hard about how it, how it was to work with Robert, how they got together, and the whole process of uh, of making movies. And Aaron's been around for a while. So it's it's a really educational uh, episode, guys. And I really wanted to bring something special for the 100th episode. So I hope you guys enjoy my interview with Aaron Kaufman and Brian Levine. I'd like to welcome to the show Aaron Kaufman, man. Thank you so much for reaching out to me, man. I'm, I'm excited yeah. to have you on the show. 
Yeah, it's, I, I really like your show. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, man. How'd you find, just out of morbid curiosity, how did you find <laughs> out about me or like, I don't like know why it's morbid. Show? But I, yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, I actually really love that there is this sort of podcast community building. Um, you know, I like uh, like John August's uh, show with Craig Mason's great. Um, you know, obviously NPR does the business. But if you look up, you know, if you Google like the, that, you know, the good. Uh... We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, film uh, podcasts, you you come up on those all the time. I so once it. once I started getting into those, I was like, oh, what else is out there? And uh, and that's kind of how I came across it. Yeah, there's a lot of great filmmaking podcasts out there, and they're and, and they're building more, getting more and more. There's a bunch more and more coming up every day. So it's just such a wealth of information. I mean, such a wealth of information. Which is great because when I when I started, there was not. Uh, there was nothing. So, yeah, you would you would you would like look. You would have to go to like the the uh, the Dove uh, whatever that guy's name is. Dove Simmons. Dove Simmons. You have he to was, go to like the Dove Simmons uh, weekend course. Two uh, uh, yeah, two day film school. Yep. And I actually had Dove was uh, number my eighth guest. Oh, uh, he was on show number eight, and he's still exactly the way you remember him. I only I only remember a couple of things. One, I remember I only went because um, I was told, and I don't know that this is true because I haven't been able to confirm it, mm-hmm. that Quentin Tarantino had gone to his yes. program. Yeah, Will but Smith, I, Quentin Tarantino. But, uh, I, no but I know Quentin Tarantino, and I've asked him about it, and he really did. Didn't, I don't know that it's true. Like he sort of looked at me confused. So I don't actually know that he that that's true. I don't know if we're breaking the story here. But wow, uh, it's so yes. so because that's been his uh, big that was been his big yeah, calling yeah, card for the last it's, two it's, decades. It's possible, but I, I I wasn't able to confirm it. And then uh, two, I rem- I'm trying to think of all the the advice at the time. Mm-hmm. And the biggest piece of advice I remember Dove giving was that you got to treat your actors well. Yeah. So you should cut the bagels beforehand <laughs> so, that, so the actors don't have to cut their own bagels. <laughs> That's actually quite great advice. It's um, how I've gotten into the position I'm in today. And, <laughs> and the other great – I had a great piece of advice from an old DP when I was on set once. And uh, you know, I was on an indie – it was like a small budget, you know, a music video or something. And the producer came out. Everyone was, what's for lunch? And, and the, the DP just turned to me and said, oh my god, they're spinning wheels of death. Uh, do you know what spinning wheels of death are? No, is that is that bagel? Is that what bagels are? No, those are pizzas. Oh, okay. Because because there's, there's no protein and it's all it's all bread. It's just all bread and it just slows the crew down and it's yep. and it's just cheap food, you know, generally speaking. So you never want to feed your crew no, pizza if you can help it. Maybe once in a blue moon, but if you can craft, help it. craft service is my specialty. So I'm, <laughs> that's, that's all I'm known for. So how did you get into the crazy world of filmmaking, man? Well, I always wanted to. I mean, since I can remember, I don't really, I don't really have other interests or other talents or or anything like that. Um, when I was young, you know, I was, um, uh, I guess, thirteen, fourteen, and um, I wanted to. Um, yeah, I think I saw do the right thing when I was yeah. fourteen. Great movie, and and that was, and I was like, you know, blown away because I, I didn't before that I didn't really know what a director really did or, or was, and I think Steven Spielberg is probably the only other director I was, I was aware of. And mm-hmm. then um, what was cool was Spike Lee actually wrote these books. Um, I don't know if you ever, I don't know if you ever saw them or not, no. but um, yeah, they, they, they're great. In fact, I think they still are great. Um, but what was cool about it is he kept these journals and he published them. So oh, like Robert, like, like Robert did. It, it, like Robert did. Yeah. Uh, but it was before Robert. And actually I was surprised when I met Robert initially that he was a big fan of those books mm-hmm. um because i i didn't know anybody else who would love them but like she's got to have it um school days and um uh, do the right thing and then i think he did them he did them for a while i know i think he did them all the way up to Mac. Oh, wow. uh, but yeah but what was cool about him was he really kept the journal and a lot of the questions i had like what the fuck does a director do um, he answered those himself, you know, or like, what is this? Or how do you do this? Or when do you do that? Or how much should this cost? And he literally has it in there. If you read the one for, for she's got to have it, he literally, um, moved, he like rented a, 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 a editing, you know, a flatbed and moved it into his studio apartment. And mm-hmm. he's yeah. writing about trying to figure out how to, how to work it, you know? So he, he really started from that point. And because there's, when you read film books normally from like, we read, the books of great directors. Mm-hmm. It's always like I was born, and then when I directed my first feature, yada yada yada. <laughs> and you're like, whoa, 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 what happened in between those right. two things? Like, you know, how did you how did you make this movie? For you know, how did this happen? Um, and so his was the first that I had read where he really got into the nitty gritty, and then from there I was really off. But um, it took me a while. I was I I spent a lot of my twenties 
um, doing other things. But um, when I was, uh, I guess about 27 or so, I had my first job in entertainment, which was, um, I may be a little older, I think it was 28 maybe. But um, I started working for Chris Blackwell um, at Palm Pictures, which was the company he started after um, uh, after Island Records. And um, mm-hmm. that was my first exposure and it was great because I got to touch you know, everything from music to film. He was even doing some really early online uh, stuff. Uh, at the time. And so it was a great place to sort of start learning a lot about the business. And then from there, it's been step by step, um, you know, trying to produce and then um, eventually producing films and then eventually working with Robert Rodriguez and then, and then directing and then talking to you. So since you bring Robert up, oh, by the way, I'm just going to step back for a second. For all the kids in the audience, a flatbed <laughs> yeah. is is how you used to edit film and that there's this thing called film <laughs> that they used yeah. to shoot movies on <laughs> uh and if you guys haven't seen she's got to have it uh if i'm not if i'm not mistaken that's his first feature right spice uh, that's that's his first yeah, yeah so she's got to have it it was kind of it's still kind of like, great no it's amazing i remember seeing it in film school and and, and during that time because uh it was she's got to have it as one of the, he was like he, he was at that he was at that moment of time where all the independent, the big independent movement started right before Quentin and Mariachi and Clerks and and Sex Lies and Videotape. It was all during those like late eighties, early nineties, and the, the the independent explosion. And yeah. Spike was right there with "She's Got to Have It." He's one of the first guys to to come out the gate. Uh, yeah, I yeah. saw that in high school, and then because I saw, I think I saw Dude, I think first, and then went back and saw his other movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, but then I remember like hearing about the Sundance Film Festival for the first time mm-hmm. when I was in maybe eleventh grade, and Steven Soderbergh, and then you know the whole Quentin Roberts thing happened after that, and that was when I mean there was such a vitality oh. to that time that it's 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 almost a bummer now because um, you know that's the uh, it, it just it's it's. That that time you're just not going to have uh, another time like that. I, I think in the foreseeable future, it was like it was basically like the '70s. Like you'll never see a run of movies and directors explode like they did in the '70s. It was just a different time, you know. Having Scorsese do Taxi Driver and and uh, Easy Rider and The Godfathers and Jaws and, and all these kinds of guys just blow up. Same thing happened for the '90s. That that little early part of the '90s, late '80s, early '90s, that independent explosion came out. Yeah, I, it's and it's something that I don't. I think there's going to be something like that again, but it will be different. Like now, but I just there's just so much now. I thought in the in the, uh, in the like sort of early mid 2000s, I thought that you would see it because there was that like Michelle Gondry, and yeah, Jones, oh god, yeah, and, and, the commercial guys, and, yeah, and yeah. Mark Romanek and, and those guys, yeah, Fincher and, and all those guys, yeah, uh, yeah, and Chris Cunningham, um, who actually never has still not made a feature, but no, did Chris was, Cut, didn't Chris Cunningham do? In, Spectre Gat? No, that's David Kellogg. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think I think Chris is still not made it. But he's he's like amazing. Those great, he's amazing. Yeah, he's the, those great Bjork videos. Oh and, God, amazing yeah. stuff. Amazing stuff. And so that was sort of I thought you know, and I mean, obviously we got some you know Mark Romanek and and those oh. guys we got out of out of that time. Um, but that's like the last sort of movement of any kind. And I think you could probably add Sofia and Roman Coppola to that as well. Mm-hmm. But but there hasn't been, and I, I always have always thought even back then because. Palm Pictures owned a magazine called um, Res Magazine, mm-hmm. which was started by a couple guys, um, a friend of mine named John Scalise, and they were really early to the digital uh, world. You know, mm-hmm. this was like back, um, you know, be uh, really in 2000, 2001. And I really thought that, that that the digital would bring in sort of a new wave because now there's all these people that have a voice that can now – make a film. I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember taking film courses oh. at NYU mm-hmm. that we had to, we, cause we were dealing with film short we ends to millimeter. Well, not only doing short ends, but where, where you would direct a shot and then you would move over and the next person would direct yeah. the next shot because, <laughs> yeah. because you're, because you're dealing with the, you know, how, how expensive um, film is now. It's like uh, people can, you know, do stuff on their, on their phones. I'm waiting for that crest and that wave of, sort of new filmmakers and, and I'm sure they're, they're here, they're, you know, here, um, in, in, uh, in spots, but there, there hasn't been like a movement of brand new filmmakers to come out of that. And I feel, and I feel now, and now we're getting off a little bit off the subject, but I'll, I'll say this one thing and then we'll move on. Uh, because I feel that, that there is a lot of talent now, uh, and you can see it. And there's these kids who've like, 
They're like, oh, I already made my first feature at 14. I'm like, you know, go screw yourself. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, yeah, like you and me were like, John, son of a, you know. And, and then <laughs> no, I, have, I, I love it. Like, I know. I, I love it, too. I've, I love it, too. I've, but I'm I've like, I movie. wish. I just haven't. I, it just hasn't. I, there's a lot of stuff being created. But I don't know that there's a lot of, you know, there, there isn't um, – the the voices per se right to, to to support it right and also I think the other big aspect is even if there is some good work out there trying to break through the noise you have to have a marketing degree you have to have a, an audience you have to have so many different things just to get noticed sometimes it's so yeah. tough it's really really tough to to break through as opposed to the early nineties like clerk like uh, Kevin Smith said he's like if I show up with clerks today. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I'll, I would never get, no one would even look at me. And, and I said the same thing about the movie that, that is integral to me uh, is Larry Clark's Kids. Oh, I and love I, Kids. And I think oh. about that because that was at that moment, especially in New York, oh. every, everybody of my generation, yeah. like that's their, you know, that's their American graffiti. Um, I remember I kids. Says, I, I don't saw know what this says about our generation, but yeah, I know, but, right? <laughs> sure. but, but that that movie today, I don't, I, you know, it would be tough to get that movie a digital release. You know, like a, a getting it's, any kind of real support around a digital release for it would be difficult. It was you know, difficult. It was difficult. But then, then. But then again, you have something like like Sean Baker who did um, Tangerine. Mm-hmm. You know that that pops out, and that's interesting. I just I'd like to, I'd love to see more stuff like that where you know you're you're, you're seeing people use new technology in different ways yeah exactly exactly so so let's get into uh the uh the question you brought up or you brought him up earlier today you work with the legendary robert rodriguez how did you get involved working with robert um i've worked i i've worked i worked with robert from i guess 2009 up until um about 2015 okay. um, and uh was right left to direct my, my first feature but i I had um, talked to Robert a few times, and I, I guess I had tried to pitch him uh, projects, which when I got to work with him, I realized how futile those attempts <laughs> were. You know, at the time, I was like, cool, I'm, you know, I'm trying to pitch Robert Rodriguez, um, and maybe he'll do it. And then I realized working with him, like, oh, wow, I never, never really had a chance, and mostly because he, he really generates so much of his, um, of his work by by himself, mm-hmm. uh, which is what makes him super special. But um, but eventually, I kind of asked, you know, what was it that you that he wanted to do? You know, and he was in a bit of a transitional period after Grindhouse, and but he still he still wanted to um, to sort of explore that. You know, Grindhouse had met with sort of um, not the response that they were they were looking mm-hmm. for. It was but rough. I yeah. think I think he still felt like man, there's something there. And he just didn't want to, you know, kind of move on and admit defeat. And so we talked about Machete. He said, you know, I have this sort of 40-page outline of, of what I want to do, and I'd like to make it into a feature. And I immediately was like, great. Yeah, I mean, he, I, he, I, I knew Machete. I remember that was the first image that comes up on the um, uh, on Grindhouse. And it just like lo- – like I was, I was in love immediately because it was just <laughs> everything right. I had grown up with and it was all distilled into this – this um this trailer and it's kind of masterful and um so i was i was in you know like a uh like a cult member right you, right you drank the cooler you know? so i was like whatever yeah yeah it was like I, I will kill i'll do whatever i have to do to get this done and it was um it, it had an interesting path where you know i um went down to austin and um i got to see troublemaker which he had built which was uh, his own studio which he had had from um the spy kids on um, uh, from like 2000, I think, or on, he had this uh, studio, which was like a decommissioned um, uh, air, uh, airport mm-hmm. that they used to use for, for the governor. And um, he now had his own green screen and his own sound stages and a back lot. And everything, yeah. And, yeah, and it was, it, for me, I was, once I saw that, it was, it was over. You know, I was, I was, I was like, I'll figure out how to, how to move down here and, and, and work here because there was just nothing there's no there's no equivalent you know mm-hmm. there's really few, i mean maybe maybe peter jackson and uh, maybe george lucas right uh you know as far as having your own fiefdom but but he it, his was it was just outrageous you know and then also i'm i'm a real kind of old i really love anything that's kind of old showbiz mm-hmm. and there was kind of even though we were in texas and it was 115 degrees or whatever it was <laughs> down there it, it had kind of an old show business feel to it um because 
you had, you know, you had your costume department and you had your, you know, this department and, and you had makeup and hair and, and everything was set up and he had a staff on board and all of his staff were like really film nerds, you know, they really were, were focused on the craft. And, um, so, so it was just amazing. And, uh, I, we, we initially were going to put Machete together as a small sort of direct to video, um, product. And his, I remember Robert really was like, look, the only thing that, you know, has to stay constant is Danny Trejo has to play the ship. Of course. Yeah. Well, you say, of course, but you know, there were other people that would have made this movie with him and there's other people that would have financed this movie with him, but they were like, great, get Antonio Banderas to play Machete and we're, you know, we'll give you $25 million. Right. And, and he really stuck to his guns and was like, no, Machete is Danny Trejo. Danny Trejo is Machete. There's just, you know, there's just no two, two ways about it. And um, I said, yeah, I mean, to me, I, I thought the same way, of course. So um, I, I remember, it was funny, when we first sat down and we were in Austin, I remember two things distinctly. One was we called Danny Trejo and he was like, I'm going to call him and let him know, you know, because this is the first time Danny was ever the star of a movie. Right. He's uh, always been, he's always been, the, he's the character actor. Oh yeah, and, and it's funny, interesting. I know people catch it, but if you go and look at Machete, what's interesting is we we went through other movies that um, uh, that Danny had done where he got killed by the main star, mm -hmm. and he had been killed by Steven Seagal a number of times. Um, you know, he gets killed in Heat, which he did with Robert De Niro. Yep. So we started going and, and populating the movie with people who he who had been who had killed him in, in the past. And now that's, flips the, the script. That's so, brilliant. That's yeah, actually so quite brilliant. It's actually, it's actually the only time Steven Seagal, little trivia, the only time Steven Seagal ever dies on screen is in Machete. <laughs> that's and, uh, awesome. And, and, uh, and I remember that was a big deal on the set that day. But it was just cool. You know, he was top of the call sheet and um, it was great. But Robert calls him, hunts him down, and I guess he was in Louisiana shooting something. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're like, great, we're going to do it. He was so excited. He was so great which he is he's actually just a really lovely guy mm -hmm. and um and he says he uh i asked him i said well what you know what are you shooting now and all of a sudden he pauses and you hear him open the door to his um uh to his trailer and yell out to somebody what's the name of this movie and the person tells him back whatever it was i forget actually what yeah. it was but then he comes back and tells me and robert and i are laughing so i'm like but danny you don't know the the name of the movie that you're starring in and he goes man I work. <laughs> that was his, that was and, he, and he does, you know. He, oh, he does, does he ever? <laughs> does some good stuff, but but he's he's a great guy, and and so that that was sort of the, the beginning. But but what ended up happening was it had such a good vibe about it, the project, and people were so supportive of it mm -hmm. that all of a sudden we were starting to get inbound calls from from people saying, you know, I would do something on this movie, or I would you know come down, or I would do this, and and Robert really, to his credit, created such an environment down there where it was really fun for people, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't like, Hey, we're, you know, we're shooting this in Bulgaria. We're shooting this, whatever. It was like, come down to Austin, the way Robert shoots will get you shot out in three, four or five yeah, days. Yeah. Times. I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you, and I know a lot of people always wonder about this. I, I know the answer, but I want you to kind of tell the audience is how he's able to get this amazing cast. Like he gets these, these amazing like a listers to come in and do bit parts in his movies. And uh, yeah. you look at Sin City or even Machete, how does he do it? So please explain it to the audience if you can. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the real, the first answer is that, you know, they, they're fans of his work. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, people look at his movies and they think, you know, there's, you know, I don't know that Johnny Depp's ever looked as cool as he has in, in Robert's <laughs> movies. I don't know that Selma <laughs> Hayek's ever looked as amazing and she's looked in his movies. So, you know, for people, it's not that it, it's, you know, uh, if I were an actor, I would want, you know, I would want him to do my poster. Like, it, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's he, true. He creates, these, he creates these iconic images, you know, but I, I think that's one level. And then I think the other thing is that he has created an environment down there where, you know, you're going down to Austin, which, you know, for a couple of days is, is a, is is really a great fun place to be he has this environment where you're not really being you know you're not being hassled in the way that you are but he also creates this thing where you know it's and I, i've tried to keep this with me it's pretty down to earth you know he doesn't really like the whole hierarchy you know he likes when people mm -hmm. hang out on set he doesn't really love when people are just in their trailers the whole time mm -hmm. and he fosters that kind of environment where you know he's he's got easels set up um with paints and stuff and, a, and an artist so that actors can be you know painting portraits and stuff while they're while you know while they're waiting instead of being back in their in their trailer and it just creates like a really artistic and and really creative environment and that's when i really started to i mean of course i always knew the importance of 
the creative, but he really drilled into everybody that it was kind of the only thing that was important. You know, like it doesn't like like being creative, being able to express yourself, even if you're not an expert. Um, if you're not an expert painter, you're not an expert musician, but just the fact that you're taking your expression and putting it out there is going to make it interesting. That's a really interesting thing. And I think for creative people like actors, that's very attractive. And so looking for that opportunity, they'll, they'll come down. And then also organizationally, he really knows production very well. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And so, and he knows editing very well, which I found uh, was was very interesting in the sense that he knew that um, you know he would know exactly what he needed from someone. Mm-hmm. So he didn't really need to to shoot a whole lot outside of what he needed. You know, he'll stop somebody in the middle of something and say, "Okay, look, I'm cutting here, so just take it to here." And he so he he knows in his head exactly where the cuts are as mm-hmm. he's shooting, and it makes it a lot easier and more efficient. So he can shoot somebody out in three or four days. And that's um, something I've seen him do um, uh, quite a bit. So the, the, it's, you know, it, it's, it's him, it's Austin, and it's also that you know, they're not coming down for 10 weeks. They're coming down for you know, four days. Right. Now, and, and it, it does, like producing a movie like Machete and Machete Kills, uh, is it as crazy as it, it is, looks like on screen? <laughs> it's, I would say no uh, okay. in the sense of we uh, – I, I mean I walked into an environment down there which was pretty you – know, they were a pretty well-oiled team – to begin with. And then my philosophy on things, you know, I'm not a yeller screamer mm-hmm. kind of drama person. You know, I like when things are, are pretty easy going. Mm-hmm. So you would actually be surprised on a set on our set how quiet and how sort of efficient it uh, it is. Um, I mean we have a lot of fun and, and a lot of the you know um, the stuff that we're doing is you know, like I, we would get to go to, so there were days where like I'd come to work on Monday and we were blowing something up. And then the next day, you know, machete is, we're trying to figure out how to, how to rig a scene where he's pulling someone's intestines out. Yes. So, you know, your, your job is definitely not dull, but, <laughs> it, but there's, there really wasn't a lot of like, you know, uh, the, the, the set itself ran, ran like a pretty well oiled machine. And even actors uh, and even actors that were, you know, known to be difficult on other sets, they tended to be in a different mindset when they came down um, to work with us um, because they 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 kind of knew that there wasn't room for the shenanigans. So people were generally on their best behavior when they when they came down um, and they they enjoyed the, the the process. Now let me let me ask you a question. How uh, this is just a, a side tip, um, and of course you can't name names, but. I'm sure you've worked with difficult actors in your in, in, the, in the past. <laughs> yes. What are some tips that you would give a director who happens to be dealing with a, a big personality or who's just acting up or just being a brat or things like that on a set, especially yeah. when the personalities are big? Well, it's a good question. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's not a it's not a easy question to answer, but uh, but I'll, I'll answer it this way. First, first and foremost, if you're a first time director mm-hmm. and you're getting a chance to work with talent. Even if they're the greatest people ever, um, but they're a big talent, it's it's intimidating, you know. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of that that's going on, and I would say the first thing to do with people that are difficult is to really take a beat before you react, right? A, don't initially take it personally because that's what everybody does, you know. Where it's like, okay, well, I'm going to be offended, and I hate him, and now he hates me, and now and then this just develops into you know terribleness. Um, so I wouldn't, I would say, you know, take a beat and ask yourself why is this happening, right? Because there are a lot of times where you have an actor who doesn't feel comfortable, right? You have an actor who doesn't feel like he's getting enough direction. Mm-hmm. You have an actor who's self-conscious who doesn't really feel confident about the scene. Mm-hmm. And I would say a good half of the time, that's where the sort of bad behavior is coming from mm-hmm. is that. And, and if you can address those things, you'll see that change. And, and that's something you have to learn. The other 50% of the time, you might just be dealing with people that are terrible, <laughs> terrible people. <laughs> And, what and that, in, in Hollywood? Yeah, no, yeah, it, look, it it happens, right? And so if you, if you if you take a beat and that's your deduction, you know the one thing you need to be able to do is you do have to maintain control. In a lot of in a lot of ways, that's your job as a director is you know just being at the helm and um and and being able to say okay, you know this is um you know this is my set and this is how we're gonna we're gonna do this. Um, and so you you do have to do that. My suggestion is that you wait. For those moments, and then you bring it out when you have to bring it out, um, because it, it happens. You know, you have 
an actress who won't get out of her trailer or takes too long and she's eating into your time. You know, there are the times where you have to go to their trailer yourself and, and, and handle it. And that's, that's something I would recommend is, you know, there are a lot of ways to kind of avoid confrontation because you can have your, your AD do it or you can have your, somebody else do it. Um, one of the best things to do is to try to handle it yourself at times because there's stuff that they'll pull with um, – if you have somebody who's a problem person, there's stuff that they'll pull with, you know, with other people on the set that they won't necessarily pull with the director. Or, or the producer for that matter. Yeah, uh, my my experience is with the, the, being being the director has a lot more weight than being a producer. But, <laughs> yes. Now, did you ever hear the story of um, Frank Oz and uh, Marlon Brando? I, I had it's actually one of my favorite where where he where he said uh, I'm not one of your Muppets. So you can't right. wear, yeah, you can't wait for for, <laughs> for the audience. This uh, the, um, Frank Oz, who's a really great director, uh, and also the voice of Yoda, uh, and also a voice of I think the Muppets. He was a, he was a puppeteer. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he did he did uh, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, which is one of the yeah, greatest. Oh my ever. god, he did. Yeah, I mean, he's he's a really good he's a really good uh, director, and he was directing a movie called The Score, if I if I remember correctly, yes. that was the name. Edward Norton, Edward Norton, Robert De Niro, and and the late Marlon Brando, and Marlon would not allow him on set. He had to direct from his trailer, and the only way he would talk to him is if Robert De Niro would 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 would, would, would be the middle person. Yeah, and I guess because he was Marlon Brando, he got away with it. Like, because yeah, uh, I mean, he, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I'd always heard those stories, and then obviously the um, Island of Dr. Moreau stories were the, were the most notorious, where he had like a, a ice bucket that he re- insisted on wearing in his head yeah. during one of the scenes, and, yeah. and and all this other stuff. But what's interesting is if you that um, documentary that uh, that that guy Stephen Riley did, um, listen to me, Marlon. Um, if you watch that, it's in, it's interesting because you you get a real feel for Rando mm-hmm. that he a lot of that the torture a lot of the bad behavior quote unquote that he was that he was um, uh, guilty of mm-hmm. a lot of it a came from the fact that he was bored mm-hmm. you know that a lot of times just the the act was he just wasn't finding enough to get him that excited mm-hmm. and two that he was trying to bring something interesting. If you go back and watch the Island of Dr. Moreau, mm-hmm. like if you watch the documentary about it, I forgot what that was called, but um, he, it just makes Marlon Brando look like a monster. Right? Mm-hmm. Then you go back and watch the Island of Dr. Moreau and you go, hey, this is not a great movie, no. but, but what's great about it is everything weird that Marlon Brando is doing. Right. So, it's, it's, <laughs> he's trying to do something basically. Yeah. So I don't exactly – I forgot exactly what the um, – where the, the rift started between him and Frank Oz, but obviously he got to a point where he was just like, you know – um, I, I don't trust this person and he's going to be a monster. And he was of a, of a mindset that it, he wasn't worried about getting work in the future. He wasn't worried about anything. Oh, he's Marlon Brando. And, right. Yeah. So, so that, that's that. But, uh, but yeah, the Muppet story is, is, uh, is, is hysterical. But Frank Oz, to me, he's actually done a, a bunch of cool movies. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, 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 I've never met him, but I've heard he's a really nice guy. Yeah, I mean, and he's for God's sakes, he's the voice of Yoda. I mean, seriously. I mean, that that alone that alone gets you drinks wherever you go for the rest of your life. I think. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you also worked on another little film called Sin City, uh, the sequel to Sin City with uh, with Robert. How, what was it like jumping into that that seat? Because I mean, Sin City was a game changing movie. It was like you know, it was iconic what, what Robert yes. did with the first one. So to come back and do the second one, how, how did that feel? And how, what, what, what some, some stories you could tell me? Super scary. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was really scary. I mean, I, I, um, when I started working with him, obviously, um, yeah, I was a big fan of really all of his work. Um, uh, really everything Robert had done, um, including the Spy Kids movies. And, um, but obviously Sin City was, you know, just such a landmark, movie and the idea of getting back into that world and um you know continuing the stories because i i was a big fan of the comics in fact that yeah. was one of our first conversations that kind of hit it off between robert and i were not about frank miller but about um uh, frank frazetta mm-hmm. and um you know the uh the those conversations where i told him what a big fan i was and we started talking about that i think he cared way more about that than any knowledge that i might have had about about film or filmmaking um and so the I was a huge Frank Miller fan and um, the idea of going back into the other stories that I knew had been written and, and not published to bring those um, into, you know, make those a movie out of those was just so interesting. Um, and, I, you know, so I, I wanted to make it, I won't get into the whole, the vagaries of it all, but the, just the rights and getting it to just to the point where we could make that movie. Really? Was so, I mean, there's a, probably a book 
in there because they had done it originally with Miramax. Right. Miramax was owned by Disney at the time. Yep. And then the Weinsteins had left to start the Weinstein Company. Mm-hmm. And then Disney uh. Disney didn't um, uh, hadn't uh, hadn't renewed the rights and um, and so at at some point and then uh, Frank Miller had you know um, uh, claims on the rights. So at one point there was like five different entities from the uh, the new Miramax, the new Weinstein Company, Disney, Frank Miller, a couple other guys. That that were that essentially all challenged the the rights and said you know we we own those so just cleaning that up took about a year oh and my God. and it was yeah it was it was uh, to the point where every once in a while Robert would say like, maybe it's not meant to be you know and so um, between the two of us though it was like no we you know we have to do this we have to get it made and then um, so that we we did that and ultimately uh, what people don't necessarily realize is Sin City two we made that independently. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. It was released by the Weinsteins, Mm -hmm. but we actually put that together as a pretty large independent movie. You mean, so you guys, you mean Robert financed it himself? No, he didn't, uh, Uh but he, he helped to finance it. He helped to put it together. Robert, Robert's actually outside of the filmmaker credit, uh, credit that I give him. he, he actually picked up the um, film finance and, and, and sort of the business side of things, mm-hmm. and he he picked a lot of that up very quickly, and he would get involved. So he and I he and I actually put it together piece by piece, from you know equity to foreign sales to debt, uh, et cetera. Um, mm-hmm. And there were a lot of people that ended up working on getting that made. But it was it was pretty much it was a pretty crazy achievement even before cameras rolled on um, on the movie. Then as far as the, the creative goes, um, you know. Getting that script to a point where you know it was going to make fans, um, you know, there was such a the 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 the, um, the fan involvement was something I was not in, really familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I did Comic Con for the first time with Machete, <laughs> and then that's uh, a that's a circus and a half, isn't it? <laughs> oh, oh man, it, 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 you know, in some ways it's great, and in some ways it's super scary because you're. You know, we did a Hall H presentation. Oh with, God, yeah, it's like seven thousand people. And yeah. That was the that was where Robert announced that um, that a, if we ever did a third machete, it would be machete in space. Yes, and that was like I remember just like five thousand phones and Twitter accounts, you know, like lighting up uh, uh, immediately. Um, but but anyway, so um, I I was not aware of of that prior. Robert was. Robert really knows the fans, and and he he himself is really kind of like a um, a super fan when it comes to that world. Um, I was, I, I have that background and that's interesting to me, mm-hmm. but I'm not as sort of into the vitality of, of what a comic, you know, comic book fan today is really looking for. Robert knows cause he, he is that guy. Um, and so he would tell me like, Oh, they're not going to like this. Oh, they're not going to like that. Oh, they're going to go crazy over this. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he, it was good that he had that kind of feel for it. Cause I, I didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, the, the, uh, you know, there were times cause you're trying to put this cast together and there were times where the producer side of me was like, all right, well, we can't get this person or this person's not available. What do you think about this person? Mm-hmm. Um, and he would look at me like, no, it's, that's not going to work. You can't replace you know, this character uh, or that character because the fans are going nuts. Yeah, um, he's right. So that, yeah, so he was totally right. And, um, and so it was, it was a lot of pressure from all sides to, to get that done. And, but the actual making of that movie um, went pretty flawlessly. You know, we did a lot, basically all of it green screen down in Austin. Mm-hmm. And um, the uh, the production was uh, was actually that was a fun shoot to uh, to shoot. That, yeah, and yeah, is and and the one of the things I I at least from the behind the scenes and all the things I've read about Sin City is that the reason he was able to get people in and out is because he shot everything green screen. So sometimes, you know, Marv would be having a conversation with with um, Jessica Alba, and neither of them were in the room. Like right. one of them went the room, the other one wasn't, and so on and so forth. And he would just composite them later. It, it happens. I mean, the, um, if you look at the first, the first movie, there's the bar scene, which I think there's like a DVD yeah. extra. I don't mm-hmm. know if people watch DVD extras anymore, but um, what is this DVD you speak of? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but there's DVD extra. Well, the show, the, the bar scene, which basically has everybody. I mean, it's uh, Mickey Rourke, Clive Owen, Bruce Willis, uh, mm-hmm. Jessica Alba, and they're all in that in that one long bar scene. And um, I don't think any of them were in the room with each other at the same time. Yeah, I know. It's it's it was pretty. Like I still remember when I saw Sin City, and my mouth just dropped because it was it was at the time when I was making my first film 
Uh, and it inspired me so much. It was just like, well, Robert in general, it's been one of my big inspirations. But that movie, when I, it was just like no one has ever seen anything like that. And how amazing is it that in today's day and age, in, in what Sin City 1, I think, was only about 10, 11 years ago that came out, yeah. that you can create something that no one has ever seen before. He literally created a real black and white movie. <laughs> like not a well, yeah, I mean, black and gray. A- you think about it, there's a lot of stuff in that movie where if you were pitching it, mm-hmm. there are a lot of objections to why that movie would not work, right? It's a oh, it's black and white. Oh. It's it's a it's an anthology film. It's yeah. Oh, God. yeah. It's a you know, it's it's a noir. Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's super violent. Super it's, it's really, violent. Yeah. So so there's a lot of reasons why that didn't work, but why it did work was it, people just never experienced anything like that before. And I think that I mean I could be I'm definitely partial, but when I look at a lot of the sort of green screen movies that have been made since Mm-hmm. I I don't know that any have really been able to go back and and um, and 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 replicate the just the pure joy that it was seeing that movie for the first time. Well, I know Frank Miller was very vocal in saying that Zack Snyder had a lot to owe uh, Robert for three hundred. Uh, bec- <laughs> I, I, think, I think Zack Snyder would probably say that as well. Because it's just like I mean, seriously, I mean three hundred. I mean, and we can get. I don't want to get off on the tangent on, on Zach, but uh, three hundred was also one of those movies. That you, Jesus, I've never seen anything like that. But I think the thing that broke that door open was Sin City, and Robert. Sure. Robert oh, broke that for, door open for sure. In fact, I think that I, I believe Warner Brothers uh, came down and actually uh, checked out, like kicked, kicked the tires to sort of get um, uh, you know get a feel for how he did it. Because there was there was actually a certain amount. Of, I don't think people understand this part is. There was a certain amount of R and D that Robert did prior, before he even went to go see Frank Miller. There was a oh, certain yeah, amount yeah. of R and D that he that he did just to see could could it, could it do this. Right. He actually had a, a pitch video that he put together yeah. for yeah. to to convince Frank because Frank said absolutely not a million <laughs> yeah, times. Yeah, I think Frank, Frank had had a bad experience with uh, was it Robocop two. Robocop uh, two. <laughs> and he was like, "Fuck Hollywood, you know, I'm out of here. I don't want to deal with Hollywood." Exactly. And uh, yeah, and I was actually in the I was actually in the Hall H. When uh, Grindhouse was being announced, oh wow, that was that was an that was a because Grindhouse, I mean, God, I, I I love Grindhouse, but I was like when I I saw it in the theater, I was one of the the few people that did see yeah, it. I, think, I, think I went to a midnight showing uh, of it when the Thursday before the Friday it came out. I mean, I was I could not have been more excited for a movie than uh, than that. And you and you were around when he was producing Predators as well, right? Yeah, well, that was kind of cool because we when I said like as far as the old 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 show business kind of quality of, of Troublemaker was, um, you know, when I, we were doing Machete, Predators was getting produced at the same time. And so we had almost like a backlot going at Troublemaker where we'd walk, um, you know, we'd be walking <laughs> one way and you'd see, you know, yeah, Danny dressed up as, as Machete with like a severed head. And then the other way you would see, you know, guys dressed up as Predators walking the other way. Having and, having uh, coughing and smoking a cigarette, right? Yeah. And so like old like Roger Corman days, I was I was in hog heaven. Like I was like, it doesn't get any better than uh, than this. Yeah, that was so that was a fun film as well. That was such a fun film uh, to to watch Predators. So then, um, so after you've you've got this, you know, you you I'm, I'm obviously you learned a heck of a lot working with Robert uh, in that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the 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 period that 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 was before my working with Robert, I learned a lot. Coming from New York, coming mm-hmm. from that indie world, mm-hmm. you earn a lot. You learn a lot of how to kind of be scrappy and where mm-hmm. to find money and mm-hmm. how to put projects together and, and and those things. And I'm 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 happy that I had that first mm-hmm. um, because it it really taught you to to sort of not take no for an answer and 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 how to get something get something made. The next phase working with Robert really taught me the 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 value of of the creative and sort of how movies can get made on a broader, bigger scale. But also using that same kind of mentality, you know, because we would try to always make a movie for less than what you know um, we had available to us. You know, we'd always try to if we could get you know forty million, we'd make it for thirty, just because it it gave us the flexibility to make what we what we wanted. And so that was um, you know sort of what I learned in the, in that phase. And then just pure production because we, we we were making a movie every nine months when I was there. Um, and so you're just constantly in in production, and um, you're that that is really better than any kind of school I could have uh, like I could have gone to. Yeah, I remember when Spy Kids was. I mean, Spy Kids kind of like launched Robert. I think financially, it's his biggest thing, right? Still to this day, I think the Spy Kids trilogy. Right? Yeah, I, think, I mean, they're talking huge. huge yeah, I mean, they were all pretty huge successes. They were huge successes. I remember when the first one. I think the Weinstein's gave him like twenty million or something like that to make the first one. 
and then when the yeah, sequel, I mean, if you any of them though, if you look at them, the, the amount of visual effects, the amount. Of- oh no, no, it's it's insane. But my point was like on the second one, they were like, "Here, we want to give you more money." Robert was like, "Nope, nope, yeah. I'll do it for the same." And and that was he, he knew the value, and and it's something that I try to remember. I don't always remember, <laughs> but um, it's true. Uh, but he knew the value of leave me alone, and I will make something dope. Yep. Um, and, you know, and, and if you look at Sin City, you know, something that different, that weird, um, you know, that original, if he had made that movie for $120 million, oh, forget there's, it. yeah, there's no way because no you, way. you just, um, with that much to lose, you'd have people just crawling all over you, second guessing, you know, should it really be in black and white? Does the whole thing need to be in black and white? Can we do this? Can we do that? You know, could, um, could these YouTube influencers be the star, you know, whatever. <laughs> the, <laughs> well, whatever. so with that said, with that said, cause you bring up a very good point. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. What is your whole take on this whole YouTube influencers or social media stars going into traditional media where many times they might be a hit in their medium, which is making funny YouTube videos or doing things like that. But when they try to translate that into another platform that they're just you know they're, they're not actors they're not they don't have those skill sets they don't have those kind of things i see a lot of that happening lately i think hollywood's starting to get burned a lot from it what do you what's your well, opinion on it I mean, you, you 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 can't you, you can't fault them for trying right of because course they're looking, they're looking and saying um okay this person's able to draw you know uh people to watch whatever they're doing 40 million times that you know, just logically, that should probably translate, you know, to 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 the theater. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally think that all of this could be good. It's fine. It, but it's not. Uh, it's not predictive because it doesn't really have anything to do with the quality of, of a film. You know, you you could have somebody who's super famous. You know, Kim Kardashian's super famous. Mm-hmm. But if you put her in a starring role in a movie, no it doesn't mean you'd have a successful movie. It would be glitter. <laughs> or, or, or whatever uh, what was Pamela Anderson's movie, uh, Barbed Wire. You know, I mean, the, I think Barbed Wire was actually a little bit better than Glitter. I'm going to say, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb here. <laughs> Let's just spend the rest of this time just debating the uh, Barbed Wire versus Glitter versus Geely <laughs> versus Geely. <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying. So that, yeah. that's the that's the the issue is when whenever you've seen that where you're basically just exploitative of someone's fame. It doesn't. It doesn't really translate because they're different things. You know what I want to. If I'm somebody who will watch a reality show, that doesn't mean I'm going to spend you know my money on a Friday to go see that person in a movie. I still want to know I'm going to get a good story. I'm going to get a good movie. Someone like Tom Cruise, people go, oh, I know that you know that's going to be this kind of movie that I enjoy. I'm going to go see it, and that and that's why he's able to draw people to to a theater. So I think that all of this stuff potentially could be good. Mm-hmm. You know, technology could potentially be great. But at the end of the day, it, it they have to have the goods. You know, it's a matter of um, you know them being able to to do it. If you look at the seventies and you know Coppola and yep. Friedkin and you know those guys were they were taking advantage of some certain technology as well at the time, mm-hmm. but they were translating it into into you know masterpieces. Um, I think that's what you need to see. Now, I would look more at a movie like Bellflower. I don't know if you remember that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, I do. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. So Evan Glodell, like those are guys who they took not a lot of money and they um, you know, it took a long time to make that movie. And um, it's not by no means a, a masterpiece, but it is it was interesting and it was different. And I think that's what people have an opportunity to do now is, you know, you've got a studio in with your computer and your phone and you know, if you have or if you have a, a, a camera, um, you know, you have your own studio. So don't try to do what a studio already does because you're never going to do it as good as they yeah, do. I've said that. So, do, so yeah. that's why Bellflower was cool to me because it was like, oh, they're not trying to replicate a – and I realized that kind of an old – it came out you know, five, six years ago. But yeah. but that was one one of the few movies where I saw it. I think Tangerine is an example of, of it as well mm-hmm. where I was like, okay, they're actually using new technology. They're actually using the the lack of resources to create their own aesthetic. Mm-hmm. And 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 that's interesting, and that will get people's attention, and I think that adds to you know that that creates something worthwhile. Um, what I see a lot of times is people that use um, technology to sort of just make shoddier versions of what you are you're used to seeing, and who wants to see that? 
Right, and I think that's what a lot a lot of people make mistakes in independent film is they to try to and I and I was one of them. I was trying to compete with a two hundred million dollar movie, and you're just not. It's just it's it's you can't you can't get the star power. You can't get the the technical stuff, and it's just like you said, a shoddier version of what they're doing better not story wise but just technically and i think that's where a lot of independent filmmakers uh, kind of fall fall flat and the ones that do break out like a, a napoleon dynamite like a tangerine they they just do them very well they do what they're trying to do very well and they stay within the world that they're capable of doing like a bottle rocket or you know any of those kind of movies they didn't try to be something else that they're not they tried to be who they were yeah, and if you go back to when we were talking about the '90s before, you can look at Richard Linklater. You oh, know, yeah, Slacker. You know, that, Slacker, right? It's like that's that's cool, and that was its own movie, and it almost used the rawness of it to 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 do it. But at the end of the day, he had a lot to say, and there was there was really interesting stuff there. Mariachi, you know, again, super rudimentary, and it wasn't about the um, the the quality per se. But he had a style. He had a, something to um, to put out there. So, mm-hmm. so I think that's that's where I'm. I look at um, uh, I look at the the world, and I think to myself that it's almost a shame that we don't have. You know, where are our next five Scorseses? You know, I, I'm sure they're out there somewhere, and they have the ability now to get our attention in a way that a Scorsese didn't. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Now, and real quick, I want to ask you on a side note. Um, what do you think about like this summer's blockbuster movie performances and, and, and the state of where we are with, with the studios and the tent poles and all that kind of stuff? Because this summer was pretty meh. <laughs> um, it, 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 uh, it was, I, I have to say though, in full disclosure, mm-hmm. I, I, I do find myself, uh, I'm in my forties now and I do find myself a little, I, I sound like an old dude these days because mm-hmm. all I do is complain about um, you know, all, all I do is all I do is complain about um, the fact that you know they don't make them that way anymore. In, in, I'm living in New York now, and um, uh, again, and they just opened up a theater called the Metrograph uh, uh-huh. in Lower East Side, and they only project film, uh-huh. um, and it's this kind of glorious place. I mean, it's a, like, there's like a bookstore and a restaurant, and oh, the, nice. the screens, and the theaters are great. Yeah, it's 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 super cool. Um, but why I bring it up is they did uh, the Palma retrospective oh. this summer, oh. and and so I I, could, I kept going back like a junkie. I mean, I was like I couldn't. <laughs> the, the Can you imagine I, just going and doing a retrospective of the Palma's work and in film every, in a theater? They, they oh. Did every film? They did every film, and oh. just seeing just seeing you know even um, Phantom of the Paradise and um, and and Dress to Kill, and just seeing it you know fluttering in beautiful 35 millimeter yeah. I was I was just I literally could not like anytime I had some time and I could do it I was I was going back to that's all I wanted to do and then I um, went to see right around the time I was seeing all these movies again I went to see Warcraft with my son oh, sorry yeah <laughs> you know, and look, I, the truth is you know Warcraft it's not terrible you know there's some good performances in it you know it's um, not barbed wire it's not barbed wire <laughs> it's not chili, you know but at the same time, I was like, you know, this is what it's become. It's almost, it's almost become something like what I think of film and what film is are almost two different things right now. Mm-hmm. Um, because it, it, this does not resemble – like this is not why I got into this business. Right. Um, it, it's just not. You know, it's loud. It's noisy. It's, it's somewhat predictable. They are trying to top each other. They're trying to make almost like roller coaster rides more than they're trying to make films. It has more to – it really has more to do with – with that kind of experience, then it has anything to do with the Brian De Palma movies that I was going to see. So mm-hmm. some people would say that television is really sucking up the the, yep. the need that people have, and that's why sort of indie film um, is is not not doing what it, what it was. And and you know what? There's um there's probably some truth to that. Um, but I will say I'm 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 a grumpy old man, mm-hmm. and I definitely miss the uh, the just just that that feeling and excitement of sitting in the theater and, and having something blow your mind. So, so after you worked with Robert, you decide to, to venture off into uncharted territory and direct your first yes. film, uh, which your first film was called urge starring yes. James Bond himself, Pierce Boston, <laughs> the greatest, the greatest. Yeah. How yeah. did you, he, arguably he's one of the, I, I, he's, he's on my top two or three, <laughs> top two, I would say top two. Uh, what was it like working with, with Pierce and working with a legend like that. Well, I had, uh, I uh, produced a movie. I worked with, um, uh, Leonard Howell 
on a movie called The Greatest uh, a, prior, a few years prior that he did with um, Susan Sarandon. Um, and uh, it, was this, it was this really kind of special movie and he gave just an amazing performance. And I had always remembered that he was, in addition to being great, um, that he was just like super nice and humble and, and, and approachable. And he was working with a first time filmmaker on that movie. Really? And I remember, yeah, and I remember the fir- being on set and he was just super, just, just really great with her and, and really was trying to give a good performance and, and really thoughtful. Um, and so when I went to make my first feature and I had built this role, um, uh, you know, sort of this shadowy character similar to like De Niro in Angel Heart, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I, but I wanted someone who could kind of bring a textured performance to it. You know, I needed somebody who wasn't just going to like chew on the scenery, but was going to, because there was some, there was a lot of sort of texture to that character that, um, who was just called the man in the movie, um, <laughs> that I needed someone who that, and also we were sort of playing with, you know, is this, is this person was a shadowy character that, you know, could be somebody, you know, is this the devil? Is this God? Is this, you know, there was, there was an element of that there. And so I needed someone who had sort of like a otherworldly um, uh, affect. And so he just came to mind and, and um, it was that plus the fact of I, I, I knew that, you know, he would, um, he'd be great to work with. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, called him up and uh, sent him the script. And, um, you know, it's always nerve, you know, nerve wracking, but he, um, he read the script and he had a lot of notes and a lot of thoughts. Um, and we talked for, for, for a while. We met uh, to, to talk about it as well. And then he, he came and did it. And I was surprised. It was, it was a little bit of a departure for him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the first day on set, because the movie's kind of a crazy movie, and we mm-hmm. had you know, albinos and, and we had little people and we had you know, all, all this little stuff happening in this one scene. And I think he walked in and was like, whoa, what is this movie? <laughs> What did I sign up for? <laughs> what, what is this spoofy? Uh, <laughs> by the second day, he was like, okay, we need, you know, we need some, you know, we need this, we need that. And by the third day, he was just in hog heaven and had like a lot of, a lot of fun. So he um, uh, was really great to work with. And then, you know, it's, it's just by itself, it's, it's intimidating to, to try to give direction to somebody like that because they're, they're, you know, they're so, you, you've seen them before. They're so great. You know, they know they've been on sets longer than you have. Um, but when I gave direction, he was super supportive and collaborative. He had a lot of ideas, um, the, a lot of the smoking stuff and the sunglasses and a lot of the, the characters' um, uh, gear. He had a lot to, to, to input for that. Um, and then after that, you kind of sit back and let him do his thing, which if I, I wrote this screenplay with um, Jerry, Jason Zumwalt and Jerry Stahl. Mm-hmm. And um, to hear someone like him – read your or you know do perform your dial, dialogue mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you sound like such a much better writer <laughs> <laughs> i definitely would say my recommendation is have somebody awesome do your movie because you sound like a much better writer once uh, once they get going exactly is it is that is that the secret to quentin's success no i'm joking no. <laughs> <laughs> i think anybody i think anybody a forced Quentin, um, yeah, I, I had obviously a way more um, interaction with Robert, uh-huh. but the interactions I've had with Quentin, he always has good advice. He always has a uh, like a great kind of point of view. You you all, you know within five minutes of talking to Quentin why Quentin's Quentin. You know, like for instance, even writing, he'll tell you like you know you know those scenes that like when the guy's got to get the key to go get in the car, or whatever. Yeah, don't write that scene. Like if it can't be great, don't write it. So like put the guy in the car. People will figure out you know that how he got there. And the little tidbits like that. That's of, a great piece of, of advice, actually. It's, it's great. You know, it's like I, as we're writing, I'm like, well, is this scene connective tissue? Do we really need it? You know, is, it, is, is this scene awesome? And uh, a lot of, of how I write now, I kind of always have that voice in the back of my, uh, my head. Uh, and, and, and I actually also – I worked with uh, Cindy Lumet before he died. Oh, my and, gosh. Uh, yeah, I spent a good amount of time with him um, working on a project that sadly never – never uh, was able to be made mm-hmm. because he passed away. But, um, but he was, he was kind of awesome at, uh, giving you little, little crumbs of advice that at the time, I don't know that I appreciated, but when I was directing, it all came back to me. I was like, Oh, right. He told me this. What <laughs> like, was the name? What was his name of that book that he wrote? Is it making oh, movies? Uh, it, was, it was making movies. I think. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that's a great, I mean, anybody who has not, if you're being a director, you've got to read that book. I read that book years ago. It's such a, 
amazing, amazing book on directing and and filmmaking. And the thing is that when you were reading it, he was nervous. <laughs> he yeah. was insecure. You know, yeah. he's Sidney freaking Lamette, man. <laughs> you well, know? What's, well, what's great about making movies is, like I was saying before about Spike Lee, is uh, and there's actually a lot of uh, sort of uh, analogs between the two of them. But he, that book, he actually gives you functional information. He doesn't say like, yeah, so, you know, uh, get a great actor to do your movie and then blah, blah, blah. He, he gives you like literally, you know, you should eat uh, lunch later in the day so you have energy to finish out your day. You know, he, he gives these kind of cute little, little anecdotes in addition to his other, you know, uh, writings to, to really, um, you know, help you to, to, to direct. But, but yeah, he was, he was amazing and he would tell you things like um, that background kills, can kill a scene. So always make sure that your um, that your background looks natural. So he used to back in the day. He would walk up if he had a crowded scene of like thirty people walking by in the mm-hmm. background. Mm-hmm. He would walk up to each one and give them a, what he would call a little bit of business. So he'd walk up and be like, "Hey, so you just got divorced today, and you just found out you have herpes, and you are on your way to lunch, and you're super hungry." And he would do this so that they all had some kind of motivation. And if you go back and watch his movies, the background's always flawless. That's a great piece of advice, actually. Yeah, it's, it's Can you great. imagine as an extra having Sidney Lamet come over to you and give you some business? Be awesome. <laughs> so, what was the biggest uh, biggest lesson you learned directing, Urge? Well, uh, directing Urge, I really enjoyed directing Urge, and, and I kind of had um, that my first uh, my first day on set. I had uh, this kind of exhilarating and also scary feeling all at once, mm-hmm. which was, you know, I was like, wow this is what I want to do. Like, this is it, you know, and you don't really know that until you do it your first day. Um, and so that was the first. And then second from that was, um, you know, that you, you can't go back, you know? So it's like you, you get almost nervous, like, okay, I got to keep this going because this is, this is, this is the greatest high that there, that there is. Um, but directing, you know, really is, uh, I learned a lot of listening, listening to your crew. You know, I had good crew. I had people that told me things that, um, that really were, you know, if you listen to them, um, there are people there that want to help you. And you also realize that you're dealing with a cult of personality. And so trying to, um, you know, trying to work with um, uh, a crew, you can um, get the best out of them by really inc- including them. And if you include them and they, and they feel part of the process, they'll give you your best. But you can also work the other way where you're kind of shutting them out and they stop caring about the movie as much. So you kind of, you almost have to be a little bit of a cult leader to get everybody psyched about the movie <laughs> and everybody focused in the same direction, and then um, and then from there to uh, to really listen to them. I mean, I had a, uh, an AD um, on on uh, Urge um, named Sherry, who was great, and she told me, you know, look, there are going to be days where you get to set where everything you've asked for is not going to be the way you want it, mm-hmm. and you have to be able to roll with that. And at the time, I was like wow, she's being super negative because, you know, I've told everybody what I want. So why would they bring me something I don't want? And then the first day on set where I had asked for something and gotten something completely different, I wasn't shocked because mm-hmm. I had been prepared for that. And that the little, little, the, a lot of times are little things, but those little things add up and, and, and um, that's, that's it. You're playing, the, you're, you're like the conductor and you're playing the crew um, in, in, in many ways. Now, what do you like better, directing or producing? I, I there's no, I mean, for me, there's no comparison. I, I will always produce because it's it's what I know how to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, at the same time, directing, you realize, like I realized myself, that as a producer, you're doing all the hard stuff. You know, mm-hmm. you're doing all the stuff that 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 nobody wants to do, um, and then the uh, and then you're handing off all the cool things to to a director. So that's um, that's sort of my feeling on it, but uh, but I, I also like producing. And producing is sort of a different muscle, mm-hmm. um, and I love to work with you know people that I think are, are great you know um, director wise. And I think I've done it long enough now where I like to be able to take all my battle scars and and help somebody not have to necessarily you know experience the same. So we're back, guys, and I want to welcome to the show Brian Levine. Levine, Levine. Uh, Levin, 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 Anything. Levin. Anything is fine. Okay, mm-hmm. just call you Bry. No, I'm joking. Uh, Bry is good. Yeah, welcome Bry to the show. And Aaron is still here, and we're going to talk about their new, uh, very funny looking movie uh, called Flock of Dudes. So, Brian, for, uh, I mean, um, 
Aaron, first tell me how you met Brian and how did you get involved with this crazy uh, group? <laughs> uh, well, to name drop a little bit, I was uh, introduced to him by Danny Masterson, who's a mutual friend of ours. Um, Danny was in Urge as well. Um, and uh, we love Danny. And he had done a pilot with uh, these guys and said, you know, you got to meet them. They're super funny. And um, he had had a good experience with them. Um, and he introduced us. Um, and Brian and I started to uh, to talk. And eventually when they had a, a rough cut of their the pilot they had done together for Comedy Central, um, they asked me to see it. I took a look at it. And I liked it a lot. It was very funny. Um, and we were – we continued to talk. And later on um, when Robert was working on Spy Kids 4, um, we needed some help uh, script-wise just doing some punch-up and adding some jokes. Uh, we had Bob Weinstein calling you know, almost daily saying, you know, you need, come on, man. You need more jokes. And so, um, is that yeah, a, that's I, a great impression of, of Harvey, thanks, by thanks, the way. It's so very good. good. <laughs> but, uh, but I, I brought up, I was like, you know, I know these guys called the post show, um, that I met and I saw their pilot and they're really funny guys. What about bringing them down? And so Robert brought them down to Austin and in like two days they wrote like a thousand jokes and, um, Robert immediately liked them, which was, um, not, not something I was expecting. I mean, not that I don't love them as well, but you know, <laughs> he just took a liking to them immediately and actually gave them small, small bit parts in the, uh, in the movie. Um, and that, that went well. And Brian and I had been friends for, for a while at that point. And, um, uh, and they had a movie that, um, they had sold to, to Lionsgate, which uh, I'm sure we'll someone to talk about, um, mm-hmm. that they had a, had a turnaround that they wanted to make. And we ultimately started working together. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So Brian, uh, real quick, how the hell was that phone call when he goes, hey, do you want to come down to Austin and work with Robert Rodriguez on, <laughs> on something, do yeah. a little writing for him? How, how was that? How did you handle that? Well, it was kind of, from what I remember, it was kind of quick. It was kind of like, hey, we need you and we need you like tomorrow. Can you get on a a plane? (laughs) So it kind of wasn't really that much time to to process it. It was just like, okay, yeah, uh, obviously we'll we'll be down there as soon as possible. (laughs) And how was it working on uh, Spy Kids 4 and that whole experience? It's great. I mean, you know, they have such a such an interesting setup they have down there with the studio and so many resources that they have. And obviously, you know, watching, uh, Robert operate and everything was, was really interesting. Very cool. Now, and where, and Brian, where did you get your start? Um, Aaron told me a little bit, you, you have a a show on YouTube. I think you started. Yeah. So we started, um, in, it was about 10 years ago. Uh, we, me and Bob and Jason, uh, the other guys, comedians from New York, we started putting up videos online. And this was actually before YouTube, oddly enough. And um, what were you we were putting, putting them up? up? What were you putting them up on then? We were just we uh, we put up a website and we just kind of said we're just going to put up two videos a week. Okay. And we're going to have a TV show on the internet, which was a new uh, concept in okay. 2005. Yes, it was. And uh, and that's basically what we did. And, um, and then, uh, YouTube came along, um, about kind of like while we were doing that and, uh, and that kind of shifted the dynamics. But at that point, word had kind of gotten out, uh, to certain people in New York about our, uh, show and we ended up doing a deal with super deluxe, which was an online comedy website that was part of adult swim. Mm-hmm. Oh, very cool. And then, and then you met Aaron and, and, um, and then you guys got uh, a deal with Lionsgate. What was the the deal with Lionsgate that you did? Yeah, and so then uh, Bob and Jason and I moved out to Los Angeles, and we had uh, written a script, Flock of Dudes, and uh, teamed up with we we uh, signed with United Talent Agency, mm-hmm. and through them they introduced us to Imagine Entertainment, mm-hmm. and uh, we developed Flock of Dudes, the script that we had with them. And then eventually we went out to the town with it and Lionsgate uh, ended up buying it. And, and that began a process of developing it with the, with Lionsgate for, for about a year or so. And how is the development process? Well, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't, I've, I, yeah, I've only kind of been through it in that way with a studio mm-hmm. uh, just that one time. So I, I can't say what it's like always, you know, it's kind of, 
what you would expect, I think, and what you've heard, which is there, you know, there are a lot of other uh, people involved. There's a lot of other opinions, and it's not just three guys writing at a cafe anymore. It's, you know, people who, who are looking at this through the lens of, at the studio level, a $30, $50 million investment. And mm-hmm. um, that kind of changes the creative process. So then, so you obviously, I, I'm, I'm assuming that the, the flock of dudes that has been produced was not produced at a 30 to $50 million budget. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. No. It was 30 or 50. Not 30 or yeah. 50? No, but, and it, what's funny was it, it was, um, we were kind of, I was putting it together with Ryan from Austin while I was still doing Sin City. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there I had, you know, this kind of, Seventy million dollar behemoth, um, <laughs> and then I'm trying to put this uh, this smaller movie together um, in in L. A. But but actually, it was kind of fun to do it. You know, it's like after working on something so big and and so so much of an octopus, doing something that we kind of had total control over was 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 a lot of fun. And even the problem solving of like, okay, we just you know we want to push this, we want to make it look as close to a studio comedy as possible, but but we just don't have those kind of funds. The problem solving or figuring out how to do it um, really was was kind of interesting, and, and I think the movie benefited from from that. We also had some other good people that that really liked the project a lot and got involved, um, and so I think what you what you see there is really not reflective of, of what the actual hard dollar cost of the movie was. So then, so then you were at the studio with Flock of Dudes, uh, and obviously the studio didn't do the movie. So what happened? How did that translate to where you are today with the movie? Yeah, so the uh, you know the rights came back to me, and um, <clears throat> Aaron and I started discussing the script because I think I still felt like it was a, a good uh, a good movie that had a lot of appeal. And Aaron read it and he he liked it, and that began kind of the process of us trying to f- to figure out how to put it together outside of uh, a studio financing it. Okay, and then you did. A, I- go ahead. Aaron? But I had never made a comedy. I mean, I had never made a comedy intentionally before. <laughs> um, <laughs> touche, and, touche. Yeah, and uh, so it was actually that was interesting as well, you know, because it was I was I was coming at it from my perspective, which was like, you know, uh, hey, there's you know, without we don't have any machetes in this movie, and there's nobody getting their head cut off. So so like we have to really make these scenes pop because <laughs> we don't we don't have the same the same stuff that our our go to you know um, our go to stuff we don't have, and so just. Grinding and grinding and grinding with with uh, with Brian and his partners um, really was was kind of was kind of fun, um, and then shooting it was a lot different because you had these guys that were just ad libbing so much that it became like you know part of the producing job was just trying to get them to shut up every once in a while because <laughs> they were coming up with great stuff, uh, but it was just you know we had we had a indie movie schedule and had to just get we had to get in and move on so so coming up with sort of a workflow. That would allow them to still, you know, um, ad lib and come up with stuff. Um, at the same time, you know, getting a good shot. That was that would, we had to learn that on on set. And how how long was the production schedule on it? I think we were twenty one days. Does that sound right, Brian? Yeah, something like that. About twenty one days. And if and I'm gonna geek out a little bit. What did you guys shoot the cam? What what camera did you shoot with? Uh, we we showed Ari uh, Ari Alexa. For, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, it looks really uh, good. It looks really great. Uh, I've I've used the red as well, um, but um, but I like Ari. Ari, we get, we get kind of a more of a cinematic uh, feel. I, I feel. Yeah, I know. Then that that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Mac versus PC. I mean, it's yes. it's it's a very big conversation. So, how did you guys get such a cool cast? I mean, I mean, I was as I was watching the trailer, I was like, Jesus, he's in it, and he's in it, she's in it. It's like. How did you get this such a, such a great guest to be put together on, on a, I'm assuming, under $30 million budget? <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the cast was kind of through relationships that all of us had, um, just being in kind of the comedy world for a while or being kind of in the film world for a while. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you get kind of momentum going and uh, other people kind of see that a lot of cool people are doing it and they want to join and then also UTA was very helpful with us in terms of getting the ball rolling with some really cool cast. And, um, and yeah, I think everybody just kind of tried to pull a couple of people in. And before you knew it, we had, <clears throat> you know, about 15 or 20 people who were really uh, some of the most talented guys in comedy. Now, and women as well. 
now how how is it like and and Aaron you kind of touched upon this when you have a group of comics and and comedic actors who are doing a lot of ad libbing especially in these larger scenes how the hell do you corral them how the hell do you direct them like <laughs> it's, you know we we had a first time filmmaker as well so it was it was I didn't I didn't um I didn't envy him mm-hmm. because he would have to sort of you know become the lion tamer um, because you have these some of these guys like Brett Gelman and Eric Andre are just like monster ad you know ad libbers and and, uh, and improv guys um, and so it was I think it was tough for uh, for him but we had to sort of explain to people what our you know what our situation was and and also create a space for them where they felt comfortable to to you know express creativity but in kind of a guideline to um, to still get the movie made. But I'm I'm really happy with with the the movie. I mean, I I, I think too when we made we made it a little while ago, and that now we look like geniuses because most of the cast have gone on to become huge. You know, you have Kamal Nanjani and um, Hannibal Burris, who's you know obviously has um, has just really blown up. Mm-hmm. Um, Chris D'Elia, you know, had um, Undateable, and and his stand up specials are have become huge, and mm-hmm. you know, and as well as Hilary Duff and Ray Liotta and and people like that um, who who had done the movie with uh, with us. So it was. It's it's been interesting to see that happen, and now the movie looks um, a lot bigger because it's got this it's got this great and huge cast. How was it working with Henry Hill? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. <laughs> well, he was he was in Sin City too as well. Yeah, uh, and actually, I I really like uh, him a lot. He's you know he's obviously a great actor, but um, but he's somebody who will. Um, like on Sin City, he'll hang out on set and tell funny stories and, and um, you know, really be kind of a, a, a good dude. He's intense, but he's, um, <laughs> but, he, but, but he's, uh, he's that kind of guy, you know, where he'll, he'll even on Flock, actually, he, he hung out when he wasn't shooting a little bit. And we were just, you know, chatting up. So he's, he's uh, always been a good guy and he was great to, to do a day on, on, uh, on Flock, which he didn't have to do. Now, um, what advice would you give uh, someone trying to produce a film in the indie world in today's in today's world? Run, <laughs> Brian. Would you agree? <clears throat> um, <laughs> well, it's you know, there's, it's like it's it's interesting. It's uh, uh, where to start with that question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think we touched on it before. You know, in, in the sense of. I think that um, you have to really get a feel for what the world looks like, you know. And I think that if you want to make something that's really different and really, um, you know, really uh, out of the ordinary, that is what I think will get people's attention. And maybe that you have to really be smart about it and lower your budget and, and try to be as clever as you can to get something out there. I would say in general, don't try to make something that the, that the studios are making really look at like what you can do and you can do with the resources you you have a lot of it like i said goes back to uh el mariachi you know it was like he had these things he's going to make his movie around those things i think it's still good advice and um making something smaller that you can control that you can make great is probably better than um you know just trying to make a yet another of that same kind of sundance movie that doesn't really have an audience in the way that it that it used to and um, and where is it, where can people see the film? So the, the film comes out uh, so, uh, September thirtieth. Um, the uh, guys at Stars uh, are our partners on it, and they've been uh, they've been fantastic. So um, you can check um, online for the, uh, the the theaters will come out this month, but they're doing a nice theatrical release uh, for the film, and then it'll be available on all digital platforms. So and who's the distributor on this? Stars. It's Stars Digital, yeah. Who did a great job with Family Fang and um, with for Jason Bateman, and um, they've been really great to work with so far. Very, very cool. Now I'm I'm going to ask you both um, the question I always ask all my guests: uh, What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life in general? Hmm. <laughs> That's good. Aaron, you want to start? <laughs> while I while I think I like while I think <laughs> he's like Look, while I, I think of something. I honestly, I honestly think that it's taken me a long, long time to to really um, be myself, you know, and to yeah. have the confidence that what you're going to say, what you're going to try to put out in the world is, is interesting and important. You know, once you, once you come to that um, kind of level of confidence, it, it really frees you up to, um, to, to, to do great stuff. But you have to have that, that kind of confidence looking at what other people are doing and trying to catch up to that 
is, is nothing. I don't know that anything great comes out of that. It's really when you dig down and, and try to do something that's um, personal and, and something that's, uh, that really only you could do, that's when you have an opportunity to do something great. Brian? <laughs> I would say, I would say uh, just not forcing issues, not forcing things. You know, it's just you can spend a, – you can waste a lot of time and energy whether in your personal life or in trying to make a movie, trying to kind of force issues. And better, I think, what I've learned is better to, you know, obviously push as much as you can. But at a certain point, if it feels like you're pushing, just take your foot off the gas and assess the situation and, and uh, kind of try a different route and and kind of uh, be practical in that way. And, and um, I think that keeps you aligned with the reality of the situation better and allows you to operate more efficiently. Very cool. And then the, the last question is, what are your three favorite films of all time? Hmm. Aaron. Oh, man. <laughs> I know Brian's <laughs> going to throw it to you, Aaron. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I like, I like how this is going. Uh, see, it's funny because uh, Rob, Brian and I have this conversation pretty regularly. My, my, I think my all-time favorite movie is Night in the City, um, oh, the original yeah. Yeah, Jules Dyson film, mm-hmm. um, which is – it's just the movie that I can watch – I can watch it right now and I've seen it a hundred times. Um, and I love that – the noir period, I love that, that time. And that's probably my, my favorite. Um, and I would say uh, maybe Mildred Pierce is second to that, they're, which they're, both of them kind of have some, some similarities. Um, mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. but that, that noir period is, is, uh, is probably my favorite. Uh, I would say, and these are not uh, off the wall answers by any means, mm-hmm. but uh, Long Goodbye Network and Eight and a Half, or you know, kind of flawless. Those are all very good, very very good, very very good uh, answers, guys. <laughs> so, um, where uh, where can people find you guys, and also find uh, the movie when it's out? I know you use uh, all digital platforms, basically. Yeah, well, it's the thirtieth. It comes out theatrically, and then um, I think shortly after that, it uh, it comes out on um, on uh, digital digital platforms. Um, and then I think it comes to Hulu next year. Um, and, uh, then, um, that's it. I, the, the theater count should be out soon. So I don't know exactly what that is. And then I'm on Twitter at a underscore Kaufman mm-hmm. and, um, I don't know what else I'm on. I think that's, that's, do you have a is. website, Aaron or no? I, I don't. Gotcha. And how about you, Brian? And uh, yeah, me and uh, Bob and Jason have a just a website that we've had for a while, thepostshow.com. dot com. And um, yeah, you got, you can find some some of our old sketches from from our New York days there and everything. So. Very cool, guys. Man, it's been an absolute pleasure, guys, uh, having you on the show. Thank you so much for uh, spending the time and uh, dropping some knowledge bombs on the on the Indie Film Hustle Tribe. All right, we'll speak soon. All right. All right. Well, guys, I hope you liked that uh, interview. I had a ball talking to Aaron and Brian, uh, and I, you know, I grilled poor Aaron about everything about Robert and his experiences with him. And I basically asked every question, any, any question I've ever wanted to know about Robert, I pretty much asked in this interview. So for me, it was a huge, uh, a, a huge thrill and joy to uh, to talk to Aaron. Uh, and also to talk to Brian in regards to a flock of dudes, it sounds like a fun movie. And again, it's about that hustle, guys. You just got to keep hustling. And when the door doesn't open the way you want it to, you got to make your own door. And that's the truth, man. It is the absolute truth. And flock of dudes is a perfect example of that philosophy. So, guys, uh, again, if you want to get any of the show notes, uh, anything uh, that we talked about, any links, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 100. And what I'm going to be doing, hopefully moving forward, is, guys, I'm going to start transcribing all of our podcasts. Uh, it's, uh, since we have 100, it's going to take a while. But I'm going to be transcoding them, uh, trans- excuse, transcribing them and adding them to the show notes. So if you can't listen to the podcast, you'll be able to read the podcast because uh, I've had a lot of requests for that. So that w- those will be going to come slowly. They're not going to be coming up in the new ones anytime soon. But some of the older, more popular ones are going to get those first. And then slowly I'm going to be taking the entire library on and transcribing them little by little. And then uh, we'll catch up and start with the new ones. Uh, Probably I'll figure out the schedule. Probably won't be the day of the release of the podcast, but probably a few days later or something like that once we get a schedule in place. But that's just another uh, thing that I'm going to be adding to uh, the Indie Film Hustle podcast. So, Guys, I again, I cannot thank you enough for allowing me to get to the 100 
100th, 100th episode. It's a huge uh, mile marker for me, and uh, I plan to get to uh, 200 very soon. And uh, and keep growing, keep growing the brand of Indie Film Hustle, keep growing uh, what we're doing and getting the word out. And please, uh, I, I, and again, I hear this from a lot of a lot of the tribe members when I talk to them. Um, they're recommending Indie Film Hustle to other people. Uh, they're t- I'm like, you got to listen to this podcast, especially uh, podcast number 88, guys. If you guys have not listened, any of you guys listening have not listened to podcast number 88, that's at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 088. It is by far the most talked about, the most popular podcast I've ever done. And trust me, if you have not listened to it, everyone who has listened to it will understand what I mean. It's intense. <laughs> and uh, if you need a if you need a bucket of cold water thrown on you, you need to you need to listen to episodes uh, episode eighty eight. But uh, but please spread the word, guys. I, I mean seriously, please spread the word. Uh, tell any of your filmmaking friends about us. If you find that this information is helpful to you, it'll be helpful to other people. And don't think of it as a competitive thing. There is no competition when it comes to art, guys. All right, just help, try to help as many people as you can. Uh, and that's how that's how you you make it uh, in life and in this definitely in this business because I wouldn't have been able to do as much as I've done without friends. You need friends, and if you can help other people along the way, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, on your journey, do it, and hopefully this podcast and the website has uh, information that can do that. So spread the word, guys. Please, uh, you know, retweet, uh, post stuff that you see that we post, and so on. And or just just tell them, like, hey, you got you to subscribe to this because I hopefully it'll help more people. You know, I really want to, I, wa- I want this work to get out to as many people as humanly possible and help as many filmmakers as humanly possible. Uh, and I, I found this online, which is the Farley Brothers' wonderful um, a theory of life. Life explained in 27 seconds. And basically it says, life is like going the wrong way on a moving sidewalk. If you walk, you stay put. If you stand still, you'll go backwards. And to get ahead, you have to hustle. Keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm, every day I'm, every day I'm hustling. Every, every, every. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. Ah, so you guys are the true Indie Film Hustler tribe members sticking around for the very very end thank you guys and as a treat uh, i told you for those who stood and listened to all the way at the end there'd be a special surprise for you as far as little little treats are concerned so i wanted to make available to everyone almost all of the courses i have available on udemy to give you all a price break to 12 bucks that's right. Any and all of my courses on Udemy will be twelve bucks, as opposed to ninety-five. Some of them are seventy-five. They're going to be twelve bucks, and that sale ends September twenty-second, two thousand sixteen. And I'm going to give you the URLs. So if you got a pen and paper ready, all you got to do. Uh, by the way, if the URLs don't work, if you go to Udemy and look up any of my courses, the code will be IFH one hundred. IFH100 will be the code that gives you a discount so you'll be able to purchase any of my courses for 12 bucks that I have access that are on Udemy. So the URLs are indiefilmhustle.com forward slash FF hacks for the filmmaking hacks course, indiefilmhustle.com forward slash T hacks, which is for Twitter hacks, uh, indiefilmhustle.com forward slash festival hacks 
will be for the film festival hacks I did with Chris Holland. IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash million for the million dollar business of screenwriting I did with Paul Castro. IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash hero for the screenwriting and story blueprint. Uh, the Hero's Two Journeys with Michael Haig and Chris Vogler. IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash red 100, which is the introduction to the red cinema camera. And finally, IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash DSLR 100, which is the course on how to make your DSLR more cinematic. So I hope those guys, I hope those, uh, these will not be in the show notes, guys. So you have to listen to what I said, uh, write down the URLs or just go to Udemy um, and click on any of the, you could go to the IndieFilmHustle.com and click on any of our courses and the the coupon code is IFH100. Thank you for listening. Thanks for sticking around with me uh, a little bit after. I hope it's worth it for you guys. Uh, and again, it's a limited time offer ends September 22nd. So thanks again, guys, and keep on hustling.